happy Sabbath, Kendall SDA, Homestead SDA, and everyone else that is joining us today. We are very happy to see you here, and we are very blessed to be able to connect with you through social media. First, online giving. KendallSDA.Church and HomesteadFL.AdventistChurch.org are the two websites where you can go and give your offerings and your time. Secondly, remember to share the sermon with a friend. Right now is a good time to text a friend or share the link to someone so they can come and watch the service with us. We're very happy to have you here. Hope you enjoy your sermon. See you soon.
to bestow its blessing on, on us all. And may as we worship and fellowship, may we experience God's divine presence. And may we look forward to the time when we will worship in the presence of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, along with the redeemed from all ages, from the east, from the west, from the north, and from the south, who, like all of us, were found faithful to receive the great welcome. Come ye blessed into my come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Oh, what a glorious day that will be. I'm looking forward to that day. What about you? So on behalf of the Kendall SDA Church, welcome, welcome, welcome. And may God continue to bless you always. Have a happy Sabbath. Amen. 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 We're going to sing a welcome song. And if you're comfortable moving around, shaking hands, please feel free to do so. Please don't be offended if somebody refused to shake hands with you. Um, but you can always wave somebody. The chorus we like to sing is Heavenly Sunshine, right? Heavenly Sunshine. So while we sing this song, feel free, move around, welcome your brethren. And again, like I say, shake hands if you are comfortable doing so. All right? Heavenly sunshine, heavenly sunshine, flooding my soul with glory divine. Heavenly sunshine, heavenly sunshine, hallelujah, Jesus is mine. How are you neighbors, how are you neighbors, so glad to see you, please come again. How are you neighbors, how are you neighbors, so glad to see you, please come again. Heavenly sunshine, heavenly sunshine, flooding my soul with glory divine. Heavenly sunshine, heavenly sunshine, hallelujah, Jesus is mine. How are you neighbor, how are you neighbor, so glad to see you, shake and be pleasure. How are you neighbors, how are you neighbors, so glad to see you, please come again. Amen, amen, amen. Okay, that was a little bit cheerful. Now we don't look that drowsy as we all looked before. Um, yes, we are... Um, but um, we worship God because it's a privilege to come in a place to worship. For me, I know it's a privilege to come in, as I said, a place. Because many persons, brothers and sisters throughout the world, they had a building at one point that they could go to worship. But you see, we are at ease in Zania, North America. Everything is nice and peachy. We don't have to make an effort to go to worship. We can just chill. And a lot of our brothers and sisters, if we read the mission stories, if we read the magazines that we get, we see how Christians are being persecuted for their faith. We see what is going on. And I'm wondering to myself, does it really impact me? Or I'm still doing business as usual. So the question I asked myself, as I shared with you last week, I shared with myself again, what prompted me to be here this morning? Why am I here? Um, maybe because I had to do the praise and worship? I don't know. Why am I here this morning? And we can ask ourselves the questions. However, as we come to worship, I pray that we'll worship God in the beauty of holiness, worship God from deep within brethren, worship God because we may not have another chance to get together like this next week. We may, we may not. So let's capitalize on what we can do today in the sense of worshiping with one another and worshiping God. Um, this afternoon, as always, those who are so impressed, and there's a few who have been impressed to go out in the afternoon when we do our mission outreach every Sabbath, every other Sabbath to go in the field and to, 
to help serve the community who really needs our help. Um, for the few faithful, thank you. We wanted to meet this afternoon, but yet there's still a few, but I'd like to meet because this has to be, uh, we gotta do a reset and how the program is going at this time. We will reset it and I'll bring you back words moving forward next month. But for now, we'll go out this afternoon and you'll be up updated as to when we'll do the meeting so that everybody's on board to make it a church program. But for this afternoon, please, those as you're impressed by the Holy Spirit to come out and help those of us at four o'clock. For the board members, next Sabbath afternoon, there'll be a board meeting via Zoom, so, and pastor will send the link out. So just bear that in mind, board meeting next Sabbath afternoon at, um, and it will be Zoom. Look out for the link and you'll get that. Uh, that's all the announcement. May God bless us as we worship him. May we do so in the beauty of holiness. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. It's now time to return our tithes and offering. I have a reading from Councils on Stewardship. William H. and Nora Anderson were leading pioneers of Adventist mission to Southern Africa. They blazed the trail for an expanding mission throughout the southern part of the continent. After ministering and establishing work in several countries, Nora succumbed to Blackwater fever and died in South Africa. Several years later, William got remarried to Mary Elizabeth Perrin. The couple served in Angola from 1924 to 1933. William used his experience and position as superintendent of the Angola Union Mission to advance the gospel message over those nine years. The Andersons scouted future sites where they could establish mission institutions. The work was too much for just them, so other missionaries came to Angola to support the spread of the Advent message. New mission stations were established in the eastern part of the country. The Lukusi and Luz missions were opened. They offered services such as medical care and education. Through Christ's method of ministry, many people came to know the Adventist message. Today, there are more than half a million Seventh-day Adventists in Angola. Statistically, one out of every 59 people is an Adventist. One of these people is Joel. Over the course of his life, Joel explored the teachings of several Christian denominations. He had a lot of questions and never felt fully convicted by any of the teachings, but eventually settled into a congregation. I had a problem with my car. It was missing a part. So, I had a friend from Shakati, who was an elder of the Adventist Church, and I went there and asked him, find me a man that has that part. And he did it. Joel's friend asked him to join him at church the next Sabbath. After Sabbath school and the sermon, Joel was given a book that answered a lot of his questions about God. The Great Controversy. I read, read, read. Then he showed up and brought me some booklets. I read, read, absorbed it all. And then I started distributing them to the others. After reading everything he could get his hands on, Joel decided he wanted to follow Adventist principles. He took what he learned back to his church, where the whole congregation accepted the message. Today, they worship every Sabbath and continue to study God's Word. The Adventist message is spreading in Angola through various means, but there are real needs here. This quarter, a portion of the 13th Sabbath offering will help with four projects in Angola. 
From building a church and an elementary school at one location to a domestic violence and counseling center at another, your offerings will help minister to those in need. Please support this offering so more people in Angola will come to know the love of Jesus.
eternal Father, as we come bowing before you this afternoon, we want to thank you for the privilege of meeting together in this fashion. We are thanking you for all the blessings that you have given us this week, uh, for the fresh air, for the sunshine, for food, shelter, all the blessings that we have. It might be too numerous to mention. As we're here today, we're just asking you to be with us. Guide us, strengthen us. You know us individually. You know our hearts. Search our hearts, and may we surrender all to you, and you know, be, be what you'd want us to be. Today, as Brother Chase is going to be uh, breaking the bread of life to us, we're just asking you to hide him behind the cross. Let not him be seen, but through his words, you may be seen, and the words may find lodgment in our hearts. We're asking you to forgive us of our many sins. We have sinned uh, in our thoughts, in our actions, in our words. We're asking you to be with us. Uh, the persons here, we come today, some of us are broken, some are bruised, some are discouraged, some are all the adjectives that you could think of. But we're just asking you to come divinely near into our midst. And not only in this midst, but in all the gathering around the world. We're asking you to be with the sick and those that are suffering. You see what is happening in the world today. You see the time that we're living in. You know, we're just asking you to help us to be encouraged, to know that, yes, it's bad, but you, you have promised that you will not leave us, that you will not forsake us, and that we should look up to you. And from you, our strength will come, and we will go on. We're asking you to forgive us of our many sins. Be with us. Continue to bless the, everyone here and to bless the program. Thank you for hearing and for answering our prayers. And what we fail of asking you, fail not to grant it unto us. Be with us as we go forward today and always. Help us, rem help us to remember that um, our actions and our words and our thoughts are being recorded. And as children of God, we need to be more careful with our actions and with our words. So we're asking you to forgive us and to be with us. And whatsoever we fail of asking you, we're asking you to grant it unto us. These with other mentioned mercies, we do ask. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 of the Bible. Solomon asks for wisdom. This is Solomon. Hey there! Solomon was the king of Israel after his father David. Solomon loved God and God was with Solomon and made him very powerful. Oh yeah! Mm. One night, God appeared to Solomon in a dream. Whoa! God said, what do you want? Ask and I will give it to you. Solomon said, you showed great and faithful love to David, my father, and now you have made me king in his place. But then Solomon said that he felt like a child who didn't know his way and that there were so many people of Israel to lead 
So Solomon asked God for wisdom. He asked for an understanding heart so that he could rule God's people well and know the difference between right and wrong. God was happy that Solomon asked for wisdom because it showed that his greatest desire was to help God's people. God said, I will certainly give you the wisdom and knowledge you requested, but I will also give you wealth, riches, and fame, such as no other king has had before you or will ever have in the future. Whoa! Then Solomon woke up and realized it had been a dream. Huh! Wow! He went back to Jerusalem and made sacrifices to God. God did give all he said he would to Solomon. Solomon was known as a wise king and ruled God's people with wisdom for many years. Yours. The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administrative justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise, discerning heart, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will, ever, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor. 
so that in your lifetime, you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me, I hate my decrees and commands. Almighty God, now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable. God, I'm just a vessel. Speak to me and speak through me as you speak to your people in Jesus' name. You may be seated. My sermon is entitled, Words of Wisdom. Look, I owe my moral development to the blood of Jesus, first of all, in his justice and his forgiveness. But my academic ability and sense of humor and discipline, I owe to my dad and my uncle, who have both passed on. But most of all, to my brother, to him I spoke to him a few minutes ago. Dr. Lawrence, I hope you're listening. The common link in communication between this, these is the way they spoke to me in idioms of short, witty statements that had tremendously deeper meaning. Concerning my education, my brother would say, get up, boy, and keep burning the midnight oil. My uncle would say, when there's a problem, Randolph, patch, the slow leak. And he would say, a stitch in time saves nine. I would ask my father as a young boy, what, would this, what does saves nine mean? And he would say, it, if you have a problem, solve it before it gets to worse. But Papa, what does saves nine mean? He says, it saves you from getting nine lashes. But let me go on. You see, my uncle and my father and my brother would always say things to me. My father once told me, Randolph, life is like a coconut tree. You see time? The roots in the ground that you can't see is the past. The trunk that you can stop is the present. But you see up there, those coconuts, that's the future. You must climb to that. I was five years old. What is he talking about? Well, he said, talk to a five-year-old child. One man was saying I have is it takes a village to raise a child. But if you go back to my village years ago, and they'll ask you about Randolph, they will tell you how difficult he was to raise. But thank God, God is raising me now. Thank God for that. I grew up in a country then where parents will give you a few words of advice. Simple statements. Where's the young mind too busy with pitching, playing cricket, cowboy and crook, yo-yos. We didn't ponder those things. There was no long lecture. Unfortunately, these bits of advice were always punctuated with a belt, a bamboo stick, a time and rod. When it came to my time, the person being punished would have to go outside in the bamboo patch or the time and tree and get a good switch. But I always had my sugar cane peeling knife, so I would cut around the edges so that at the first lash, it would break. And I was screaming and pretending to pain. But one day my father saw the, the cut marks on the bamboo. He said, oh yeah? And he got a bigger stick. You know how the, the story ended. Good. Um, these stories, these sayings were always punctuated with a belt. The child being punished would be one, as I said, to bring the rod. But listen to this. Unfortunately, as life goes on, whipping was the common task for punishment. Why spare the rod and spoil the child? That only had one meaning to my generation. And when you hear that, you conk the syllables with the stroke of a whip. So my first introduction to the book of Proverbs, six years old. In fact, let's go to what it first heard. Whoever spares the rod hates his son. Listen to this. Fathers never beat their daughters. There was a special bond. And I can tell you this. Daughters had a way of wrapping their fathers around their fingers. I can tell you that from experience. Continue. But he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. So parents were encouraged to apply the rod of correction, punishment, to drive out folly so that the child will not follow a path of destruction. 
Proverbs 29, 15 to 17. A rod and a weapon man impart wisdom, but the child left and disciplined disgraces his mother. When the wicked thrive, so does sin, but righteous receive it downfall. I like the way those words sound. Yes, so Papa, where do you get this verse from? Every time you keep on talking to me, you say, well, you love to read. You will soon read, can you eyeballs go out? You will soon read, can you go blind? Here, read this. And you can give me the big, fat, dog-eared family Bible. I tell him to read. I go, there's two books. The Reader's Digest, which had a caption called The Last of the Best Medicine, and the Bible. Let's go back to the Word of God. The book of Proverbs. Bible scholars posit that these wisdom sayings were written at a time when the kingdom of Israel was united and peace and prosperity so characterized the area that it was conducive to the development of effective wisdom. Proverbs. A simple saying that holds a hidden, deeper message, just like a proverb. Short statements about truths about human behavior. Some are written in a teaching style. As you read them, you, you get the impression that there's an internal dialogue going on between you and someone. And these proverbs inspired and comforted the sad, the depressed, and gave renewed hope, and in some cases solved problems too. You find them in Ecclesiastes, Psalms, and you will find that these are saying to you may hear the on. As a child, I had these things too. I read about the fox and the crow, the meaning of sour grapes, because you can't reach them. I knew all of Esau's fables, but Proverbs was the pick of the crop. They were usually two lines long. It's a serious metaphor on human behavior, written for instruction, given the form of the imperative or command, and always in figure of language. Here are some I learned by heart before I was a teenager. First one. Lying lips is an abomination to the Lord. Proverbs 12 22. Let me share this. You see lies and curse words? My father, we go up next to a rum shop as a boy. My father will say to me, I, I said it this morning, listen, Randolph, fish live in the sea. You fish they're salty. Because the rum shop is there, you don't have to curse. But if I hear you, he will get a pound of salt, a little water. Boy, ever wash your mouth. I mean, he never did it, but that threat and my father's look was enough. And, and, and they will ask the same question. And if you let my father, don't lie, they will ask the same question different ways at different times. And if you slip at once, you know what you will get. And they will, tell, they will say, a liar must have a good memorandum, not mem memorandum. Another one, Proverbs 10, verse 1. A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish man despises his mother. Proverbs 11, 22. You know, this one was a technical one because there were always engagement parties and wedding receptions in my village, and sometimes you have a person to speak on behalf of the wife and of the mother, and this is the one that the guys always say. I don't know why. As a jewel... In the swine's snout, so is a fair woman which is without discretion. Proverbs 11 22. Better to live on the corner of the roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. I made sure that when I got married, my friends didn't say anything like that. Because you know, I can live that down. But it, Proverbs was always used in my village days. I don't know where with my where parents got these things from, how they learned it by heart. And then he heard, discipline your children, and they will give you peace. You know why? Well, this is good. Children are now getting children and killing children. They are now serial killer teenagers. Look at that. But they always serve. My son, forget them, my dog. They're not talking to my son. They're talking to everyone because we're all sons of God. This one, you remember, a soft answer turneth away wrath, 
but with this word sir, anger. That is true. When you are angry, and the other person is angry, you are adding fuel to the fire. That is why the tongue of the wise uses knowledge all right, but the mouth of fools pours out foolishness. You know, church, talkative people like to hear their own voice. And they talk and talk and talk. But you see, when you when you lie on someone, let's use this example. When you lie on someone and you besmirch that person because you can't stop talking, this is what you do to them. You see this crushed paper? No matter what you do, you cannot get it straight with the creatures. But when you lie to persons and stand at their names because you talk too much, you can't repair the damage. You cannot unring that bell of slander. That is why speech is silver, but silence is golden. I couldn't go home with a gossip. My father would say, boy, God give you how many ears? Two. How many mouths? One. That means you listen more and talk less. And there was a, 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 a little caption in my house. What, when you come here, what you see here, what you hear here, when you leave here, let it stay here. I, I, I can go on. You see, look, the Bible has always been a source of wisdom. But in my generation, as, as a teenager, the Bibles were always in fine print. There were no red letter editions. There was no internet. So parents had a way of breaking it down in everyday language what is called the language of relaxation or Creole, and they would talk to you. So the child always understood, and therefore, we knew the Bible. We knew the wisdom words because my parents applied to them. But let's, give, let's get back on track. Wisdom words were always moralistic. They were always teaching you. Solomon must have been 20 in David's 40-year reign. So he lacked experience, and he wanted to assume responsibility. Look, you see leadership? I respect pastors, doctors, lawyers, anyone on whom authority is delegated. You know why? They have to make instantaneous decisions and take the consequences. Take, for example, a nursing supervisor in an intensive care unit. The doctor isn't there. Something is going wrong. He or she must make a decision. Leaders must be bold innovators with a rational mind. Pardon me if you quote my favorite writer Shakespeare. He said, uneasy is the head that wears the crown. He also said, heavy is the head of those who are in charge. This phrase has come to English idiom, meaning that those who are charged with responsibility carry heavy burden and makes it difficult for them to relax. So let me go back to Solomon now. The Lord was so pleased that Solomon had asked for this, so God said to him, since you've asked for this and not life or wealth or the end of death, I'll give you more. I'll give you the eternal soul. You see, life on planet Earth, we put emphasis on the tangible wealth, jewelry, cars, possessions. But look, there's an expression in French called la deuxième enfant. It means the second childhood. Once a man fights a child, that's a proverb too. It means that when you get 90, your teeth will fall out. You can't see. You need adult pampers. You're a child again. And we pride ourselves on life. Life is tangible and transient. You can go outside now and sit and, and, and break your neck. That's how so delicate life is. That's how we must all be ready. And what did the apostles say? Silver and gold have I none, but I have a gift to thee. So I'm rich. You know why? I got eyes that see, lips that speak, and the brain that works, etc. Solomon had this dream. Dreams are so important. Joseph had one too. 
please discuss your difference and dispute. Test one, Solomon's decision, a wise decision. Read all the story. During the night, this woman's son died because she lay on him. So she got up in the middle of the night and took my son from my side while your servant was asleep. She put him by her breast and put her dead son by my breast. The next morning, I got to nurse my son, but he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning, I thought it wasn't my son I'd born. That was a blatant lie. The woman said, the other woman said, no, the living one is my son, the dead one is yours. And they quarreled and quarreled and quarreled. I can't get this thing understand. I, I don't want to go and talk about the, the, the delicacy of the importance between mother and son. I'm not going to do that. Men don't understand that. We don't understand the pain that women go through. We can only empathize. But let me tell you something. It is binding and comforting. Bring me a sword. So they brought a sword to the king. He gave an order, cut the living child in two and give half to one, half to the other. That's macabre. That's gothic. That's unthinkable. That's scary. The woman whose son was alive and deeply moved out of love for her son said to the king, please, my lord, give the living baby to her. Don't kill him. The other woman said, no, nah, he's not mine or yours. Cut him in two. What did the king say? Give the child to the first woman. Don't kill him. That's the mother. That's the wisdom. That's what Solomon asked for. Church, ask for wisdom. It will guide your life. Even in your conversations with your friends and church family, ask for wisdom as you speak to them. Now we can understand how proverbs, how words of wisdom are so important. I know a professor once. You know, children today find all kinds of ways to cheat. So this assignment comes in. The same paper, same paragraphing, same content, two different names. They were cheating. Remember I said, a soft answer turns very well, and wisdom. They call to the office. I'm just going to create names. Martha and John, this paper is the same. One of you will get an F and repeat the semester, one well, will get an A. You two decide who will get what. I'll leave you. Ten minutes later, they came back. The one who cheated, but they both conspired to do so. They admitted. But I was the person, John said, let's call me John, who did the first paper. He just superimposed his name. Okay, John, you're going to get an A, but sit before me and write the paper. That's the cheating. He didn't want to fail them. It's so hard to pay for college and to repeat it. But you see, he asked, he used wisdom. We have to use wisdom in all dealings. Let me continue with these sayings that I heard as a child, especially at wedding ceremonies. A worthy wife is a crown to her husband. But oh, hold on, I won't change that around. A worthy husband is a crown to his wife as well. Okay? So, think of Proverbs again. Proverbs 10 verse 4 says, Lazy people are soon poor. Hard workers get rich. But we reverse it. No. We say, in my country, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. That's not true. The poor get what they deserve. They don't work. Proverbs 6 6, 11 says, it's about enterprise and industry. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a, fold, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. The moral lesson here is the virtues of hard work. Proverbs 24, 16 says, as a door turns on its hinges, so a sluggard turns in his bed. You know, I, I remember a story called, look, let me say this first. We always think in life that our parents didn't have the parental manual. But the entire Bible is a roadmap 
for advice. All aspects of lives, the Bible, I listened to a man called Billy Graham in the 60s who said, the Bible is God's love letter to the human family. And in that Bible, you have advice for falling in love, advice when you're having children, advice for finding a wife, eh? advice for everything. You know, I, I, I listened to an uh, evangelist called Claudius Morgan once. He always traveled with a musical band. And if it was him, I would have my band speak up and say, the B-I-B-L-E, that is the book for me. I, I tell you, if you, if you ever hear of Claudius Morgan, if you, ever, ever, ever go to him, see his presentation, it is wonderful. He was a musician before he was a Christian. And every sermon is punctuated with a band. It was a living experience. Solomon now, and, and the book of Solomon is a profound knowledge of human nature. It's the ethics for everyday life. His wisdom spread to all people in all lands. Even the Queen of Sheba came to see him. But Solomon's wisdom was only worse. He entered trade agreements with other nations and added prosperity strategy by building peace and United Kingdoms to marriage alliances. Wisdom was the center of his rule. Let it be the center of your life, church. David's rule was centered in military might. Remember, Saul has killed his thousands. David has sent the thousands. But yet, so God said his hands were too full of the shedding of blood to build the temple. Nathan told David, or he was told that you are not to build a house for God's name because you are a warrior and a shed blood. Solomon was a counselor and united people in love and wisdom. Hold on a minute now. But don't think that wisdom is really expressed in Solomon. Definitely not. Because the Bible is a font of knowledge, generations of people have used it to modify these words. For example, justice must not only be done, but must be seen to be done. I grew up hearing that. I also heard, first to thyself be true, and then you can be true to everyone. The enemy of your enemy is your friend. I never understood that until I got in a fight when I was a schoolboy. And, and the person who was beating me, he had an enemy, and they used him to get vengeance or get something back. So I understand the enemy of your enemy is your friend. And I'm, I'm going to quote a very famous play called Hamlet. Never be a lender or a borrower be. That's good advice. But even when he is old age, he fell away from his faith, his wisdom still shone. Well, he had how many? 700 wives and 300 concubines. I don't understand that because sometimes, sorry ladies, one wife is too much. How can you have 700? No offense, I'm just speaking generally. Solomon said, in Ecclesiastes, all is vanity and vexation. Let's go there. Solomon um, forgot this chapter, verse, verse 17. So I hate his life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Church, you heard that? We are chasing after the wind. We can't catch it. Look, money goes to ad infinitum. There's no limit you can keep on counting. You are just chasing after the wind. Solomon said, I hated all the things I had toiled and found in the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. Connection to reality. We are subject to times and changes in which we have little or no control because God's sovereignty predetermines all of life's activities. Time is an ever-rolling stream, so that big house, that mansion, that car that you have, you can't take it. Dust to dust, the art returns. You, you bring nothing, you carry nothing. So you, you're just working for your generation, okay? Everything will soon turn to dust back. So stop chasing the wind. When you fight, 
together. You can't take it with you. That's what that's what he said. Continue. Now all he has been heard, here is the conclusion of the matter. This is Solomon. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every living thing. But let me go now to the words of Jesus. John 3 verse 8. The when those wherever it pleases, you hear this song, but you can't tell from where it comes or where it's going. So it is with everyone born the Spirit. Verse 8 says, the Holy Spirit, verse 8 means, for example, the Holy Spirit is sovereign. He works, and the Holy Spirit is a person. He works as he wills in his renewal of the human spirit. He has a will of his own. He says who he wants. He cannot be controlled by us. We can't work ourselves in his favor. We can't use good works to be saved. Jesus was not referring to the wind, but to the relationship between us and God. And don't forget the, the Beatitudes. I grew up on these. Matthew 5, verse 3 to 12. I'll just read some of them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Isn't that reassuring? Blessed are those who mourn for the company. The Bible speaks to everyone, every situation, all the time. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. But look at this one. This is verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You, you think of the Roman heart around the Spanish Inquisition. You know that one of them, because of Christian faith, one of the bodies, I forgot which one, was exhumed, dug up, and the bones were crushed. Okay. Think of the apostles. We're talking about persecution for the sake of Christ. Paul was beheaded, beheaded by Nero. Stephen was stoned. John was put in hot oil, hot oil and then exiled. Andrew was crucified. Bartholomew beaten and crucified. James was stoned. And James beheaded. That is James. Matthew was prayed to death. Peter was crucified upside, upside down. Look, this Christian pathway is a serious. You have to stand up for God, otherwise you will lose out. Look at this. Matthew 9, verse 15 to 17. Then Jesus answered, How can the bride, how can the guest of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from him. Then they will fast. You understand that? But you know what I love? I love this one. This is verse 16. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment. But it will tear worse. What does this mean? Let me continue first. Neither do people pour new wine into old wine skins. If they do, the skins will burst, and the wine will run out, and the wine skins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wine skins, both are preserved. Look, the truth of the Bible is a truth worth dying for. Let me explain this to you. The new love Jesus is talking about, the new way of life, this writing of God's law in the hearts makes us new from inside out. It changes a person. It transforms you completely. It means the old habits, the old haunts, the old music, the old friends, the old drinks, the old language, the old everything stops. A new way of life begins this transformation by the power of God's spirit in us. The things I used to do, I do them no more. Simple. When I first became a Christian, you know the song that inspired me? Sin will take you, I forget the exact words, sin will cost you far more than you want to pay. It will take you further than you want to go. I've lost friends because of that. They just say hi now. I don't connect with them anymore. You have to internalize, internalize this. Remember, the journey from sin to redemption is trying to hold on to God's 
unchanging hands where we're living. The rest of the old life is a fruitless, is as fruitless as sowing a new patch on an old garment. When it's washed, the new patch shrinks and rips a hole apart, making the tail worse than it was before. That is why you cannot use the old garments. The garments is a metaphor for the old man, the man of sin. Trying to put God into an unrepentant life is like putting new wine in an old wineskin bin. As the wine ferments, the expansion causes the air to expand, but the wineskin doesn't expand with it, but it bursts instead. Following Jesus means taking on a whole new lifestyle. It means turning away from the old life of sin and following his direction, his commands, his rules, his laws become more important than my desires. He, his will overrules your will and your desires. If you let him, if you let him. This transforming power he brings to life cannot be adequately explained. I can't explain it. What are we doing here? I, I, if my friend is back home 20 years ago, he would see me now. This is, hmm? they don't believe it. It can only be experienced. I can talk about it, but I can't give you the full feeling. No matter how much you can talk about it, it is absorbed into your life by faith in him. You can only know what it is like. You cannot know the joy and peace that God brings unless you surrender yourself to him. Only then can you realize the, the, the legality of peace he leaves with us. All we need to do, class, church, sorry, is to live with Christ in you. The difference in you must be Jesus. Others will see the difference in you. You can't put a light under bushels. It has to shine. You can't pretend to be Christian. No, that's putting, remember, remember the, the sort of the white skin, the old balls, that's doing that. And, and look, you know what, the Christians, let me use a quote here, a proverb for you. Water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. The grace of God is everywhere. Drink it if you want it. I, I, I want to go back again to my, sorry, to my, 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 my boyhood days, and my father, these problems. On one occasion, when my sister Esteline, sorry to call her name, was being punished, because in those days, mothers punished girls on the set, not fathers. My father took the belt, and the few crocodile tears in my sister's eyes almost murdered him. And he said, I'll tell you this, the writing is on the wall for you at five years old. What does that mean? He repeated it. I guess it was the statement and his voice and his looks. As soon as alive today, when we talk about this recently. Papa, what does that mean? You're always talking these things. I don't understand what they mean. Again, he said, read this, because you will soon read that you go blind. Daniel 5, 22, 24. Reading this. After the fate of the wickedness of Daniel continues and waits and waits. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart. Although you knew all this, you have lifted yourself up against the whole Lord of heaven. They have brought vessels of this house before you, and you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and stone and bronze and iron and wood and stone, which do not see, hear, or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him. The writing was many, many, Tekel, the first. This and the interpretation of each word, many, God has numbered your kingdom. And finish it, Tekel, you have been weighed in the balance of found wanting, Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the middle person. Esteline, the writing is on the wall for you. I start to understand that sometimes it may be too late. Don't wait, church, for the writing goes on the wall for us. He, in that time, Russia has lost the kingdom. Do not lose the kingdom of God. Take notice. 
I'm probably going to say to me, but, 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 um, but listen to me, son. Christ is also, Christ also wrote so well, there's also a writing in the sand. What does that mean? Until one night, remember brothers, all eight of us, came home late after 12. Do not get in the house after 10. We all got home late. It was a fear in this village. We got home late. And my father woke up when my last brother came in. And who just came in? And we pointed him. He just came in here. Who about you? My father said, he who is without sin cast the first stone. I realized then that the snores we heard were pretentious snores. My father heard everything. And we knew. We put the back down and said again, he who is without sin cast the first stone. I'm going to say this to you. Let us as a church admonish, love, advise, delve into these thoughts of wisdom. God is the one who holds us together. Because we know our Redeemer liveth and is coming soon. The, the coming is nearer now than it was before. Every day is a step in the coming of God. Let us be true first to ourselves and then to God. Then to ourselves. Remember, we are soldiers. Put on the full armor of God and fight for the truth. It's my word to you. As we listen to the song, Onward, Christian Soldiers. Thank you very much.